Welcome back to Think Tech. Here we are, and uh, we're doing Hawaii Food and Farmer uh, Remote. We're doing it with the John A. Burns School of Medicine uh, in downtown Kaka'ako. And, uh, and I'm here, I'm uh, Jay Fidel, back in uh, Control Central here in uh, downtown Honolulu. And so we have our, our hosts uh, are, are on location, and they are, as you can see, Justine Espiritu and Matthew Johnson, our regular hosts uh, of Hawaii Food and Farmer. And they have a special guest with them. It's Erin O'Keefe. Uh, she's an ORISE, I guess O-R-I-S-E fellow with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And we're delighted and happy uh, to see her here. Let me explain uh, that in, in 2015, uh, HCDA, the Hawaii Community Development Association, um, and uh, Oahu Fresh submitted an application for technical assistance uh, from the Federal Local Foods, Local Places Initiative. Honolulu was one of 27 communities selected to develop a food system action plan. And then planning workshops on local foods and community livability are taking place this very week here in Kaka'ako, like today. And in this particular episode, uh, Justine and Matt will talk with an EP representative, namely Aaron O'Keefe, and see what's going on. Um, the EP representative is, is, is the EP is, is leading these workshops. So we get background on the collaborative federal program, and we're gonna hear how the EPA and the planners see local food as a catalyst for smart growth, for community engagement, and revitalization, and we are so excited to be doing this remote. Okay, Justine and Matt, take it over from here. Aloha, thank you, Jay, for being flexible and creative with us. Um, as Jay mentioned, uh, we are here kind of holding these workshops right now. This is a, a process that has been um, coming for a while with the application we put in. Um, a little bit of the impetus impetus for the, the grant is recognizing kind of the energy and activity that is currently going on in Honolulu revolving around uh, local food, whether it's from a, a food security perspective or a community um, kind of engagement, uh, bringing community together kind of uh, force. We see a lot of opportunity and a lot of things going on. And when we heard about this grant, it seemed like a good opportunity to bring in some expertise of folks that have seen communities kind of rally around food projects and go from idea to implementation. And it seems like a good resource to kind of build the capacity for what's going on here in Honolulu. So um, with, as you mentioned, we have Erin here. Uh, she's going to give us a little bit of background on the program and kind of the EPA uh, stance on it. And we're also going to get to hear uh, her background and her kind of interest in these kind of uh, projects and her position at EPA to get a little bit of background. So I can hardly <laughs> turn my head, but thanks for joining us, Erin. Yeah, thank you for having me. Aloha, everyone. Um, so I'm Erin O'Keefe. I'm an ORISE fellow at the um, U.S. Um, Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Sustainable Communities uh, here from Washington, D.C. Um, so the EPA's mission in general is to protect human health and the environment. And in the Office of Sustainable Communities, um, we are an office in the Office of Policy within the EPA, so not a regulatory office. Um, and we do our work in a variety of ways on local, state, and federal levels. Um, so on the local level, it's with technical assistance programs like local foods, local places, um, really being on the ground where land use decisions are made. and. Um, then from the federal side, it is um, working to collaborate among federal agencies to make sure that we are coordinating our efforts and not working in silos um, to make them more effective in the way that we help communities. So the reason that we work on local physical places in our office is because we believe where and how we build our communities has impacts on human health and our layer, land, air, and water. Sorry, I combined this there. <laughs> I like um, that there. Layer. layer. <laughs> um, but so I'm an ORISE fellow in the office, um, and EPA is one of several funding partners for the Local Foods, Local Places program. We work with the United States Department of Agriculture, Department of Transportation, the Centers for Disease uh, Protection, <laughs> or Control and Prevention, um, and then in the applicable areas, we work with the Appalachian Regional Commission and the Delta Regional Authority as well. 
Um, and we're all working on this because we believe that the issue of local food and creating healthy, walkable communities relates to all of our missions um, in all those agencies. So another reason that we're working on it is because we've heard from communities across the country, like Honolulu, that they want assistance in having the conversation of how to use local food as a tool for economic development and as a means to create those healthier, um, walkable communities. So um, this year is the second round of the program. We're working in 27 communities, including Honolulu, which is a huge deal because we had 340 applicants this year. So to be one of 27 out of 340 just goes to show all the great work that's already being done here in Honolulu. And just seeing uh, Matt and some others like uh, Daniel took us around and Hunter. Um, and some others took us around the community yesterday and we got to see some of the great work going on here, um, which was just really, really inspiring. Um, so right now, I guess you should talk about it. Well, do you now? Do <laughs> you want to go? Ask oh, yeah. Okay. I'll say, we're really <laughs> close <here. Yeah. laughs> Um and that's a great background on the program. Can you talk a little bit about like local food, local places specific and kind of tying it into maybe some specific example of maybe projects from last year that you've seen or even this year, just so if someone's not quite familiar with the program, what what are some examples of things that may come out of this? Sure, process? so like a tangible example, um, would be, we actually have a short video on our web page that shows one of the communities that we worked in and some of the progress that they've made. Um, so I can talk about them a little bit um, to give kind of a more tangible example yeah. of what this looks like at the end. Um, so we worked in Corbin, Kentucky, actually in the pilot phase of this program. So it was about a little over two years ago, I think. Um, but so Corbin, Kentucky is a small economically distressed area in Kentucky. And they had a vacant lot on their main street um, so they were able to start a farmer's market on that vacant lot and they also kind of used it as an incubator sort of so there were artisans as well as local food um, sold at the market and it was able to help them create kind of a network so um, Andy Sammons was our main point of contact there and he helped run the market and he also opened a coffee shop downtown so when vendors um, felt like they were outgrowing are doing really well at the market, they were able to move into his coffee shop and have a small corner of the shop and sell there. So what kind of product was that for yourself? They were selling pottery and jewelry. Um, and so they started selling in his shop and continued to do well and he let them use the upstairs, I think, for um, space to continue um, creating their product. And then Andy was able to help them find a vacant building on their main street to eventually move into and start their own brick and mortar store. So that just kind of shows the progression of the economic development and also just revitalizing their main street. And can you kind of explain what the, the status of that project was when they applied and maybe why you selected and then what was the specific assistance or how did the, the workshops or the participation then like take them to the next step from where their project was when they applied? Sure, so um, when they applied, I think they they were really, they had like a huge vacancy rate downtown. I can't remember the exact number, I don't wanna tell you the wrong one. But now they're down to about 5% vacancy rate um, because having that farmer's market on their main street was able to bring some new people to the area. Um, so then all the shops, or not all the shops, but a lot of people were like, oh, I wanna have a store on the main street. There's so many people coming here now, like it's a really great place to be. Um, so that was the connection there. But when they apply, I wasn't in with the office at the beginning of that, but from what I understand, it a really vacant main street, um, the coffee shop that our point of contact opened was one of the few things there. Um, and it was just some vacant lots and it wasn't really that great place to be. So they had the workshop brought together. Um, one of the great things I think about the workshop is the ability to bring together so many different people that are working, not necessarily on the same issues, but on similar issues that wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to talk to the others about what they're doing and collaborate. So um, I think that has a real power to help everybody kind of network and bring together 
a tangible idea and say, oh, like, I didn't know that you were doing this, or like, so I'm doing, but now that I do know, I can connect you with so-and-so, or I would mm-hmm. get involved in that. I think it helps kind of push forward. And that's kind of what we were seeing just last night here, yeah, where we were having kind of a group discussion. <laughs> A uh, group discussion where people were just kind of getting this whole event kicked off. And um, yeah, the same thing happened where someone's like, oh, you know, we really need this. Or this would be great to have. And then someone else would say, like, well, actually, we're already working on something like this. So just that in itself, um, you, know, you think, you know, at Honolulu is a relatively small community, especially with groups working in ag, there's still a lot of, um, I guess, disconnect between these groups. And I think that's probably one of the best assets I've seen so far out of this, this facilitated process that you guys are helping out with. So it's neat to hear that that's kind of a trend that maybe you're seeing across the board with a lot of the other, the other cities. Definitely. Um, before we have to go to break, can we get a little background on yourself? Like how did you, so you're a fellow right now with, with EPA, how did you get into this project specific and, and you know, what's your background? So um, I am from originally a small town on the eastern shore of Maryland, um, of Penn Island. So it's an island in the middle, of Chesapeake, the middle of the Chesapeake Bay. My dad was always really into fishing and saving the bay, which kind of spurred my interest in the environment and environmental stewardship. Um, so I went to the University of Maryland College Park and studied environmental science and policy um, and focused on politics and policy and minor in sustainability. So those were just things that I, my dad and my mom and my family kind of instilled those values in me growing up and I pursued it in college. And I was a part of a program at the University of Maryland called the Federal Semester Program that had um, an energy and environment track to it, which was a fall seminar paired with a spring internship. Um, So one of the adjunct professors for my seminar is someone that works in the Office of Sustainable Community, so I just had a really great um, connection with him because it was a topic that I was so interested in, and we were able to leverage that into an internship in his office in the Office of Sustainable Communities. And then through that, I was able to get um, a fellowship with them, where um, my focus really, when I was an intern, was on this local food, local places, and I continued to work on that. Um, and going back, so whether it's helping come to communities like this and just help facilitate the workshop and work with our contractors, or um, we're trying to make more of an effort to show what has happened in the community since we've been there um, and show their success stories. So I've been helping with that a lot, um, talking to past communities that we've worked in and mm-hmm. trying to track their progress a little bit and see where they are. And then also going with, um, like I said, with Corbin Kentucky, I went with our Office of Multimedia um, back to the community last summer and we oh, awesome. were able to uh, shoot that short video on what they've done and in a few weeks I'll be going to Williamson, West Virginia, which is another uh, great community that we work with and we're going to show what they've been up to. Hey, Aaron uh, and Justine and Matt, we're going to take a short break, but before we do, I have one question. Why, why was Honolulu uh, selected with these other 27? What is it about Hawaii that attracts EPA here? Right. Well, I think it was a really competitive process. Um, there were a lot of great applications. And some of the things that we looked for were just the tie to um, showing how their projects connected to a sense of place. Um, and then also the food focus. But then there's also just looking at the momentum that's already here. And I think they were really in a sweet spot um, between what they already had going on and the capacity. Um, so we felt that it would be really beneficial for us to come here. Because um, there are some communities that submit wonderful applications, but if you look at the capacity side, it seems that they could do it without us, and you don't want to go to those communities that are just going to be a slam dunk. Mm. Um, obviously, you want to help the people that are in need. Yeah. Well, so after I, three days now of workshops, do you still feel the same way? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the community tour yesterday was just great seeing all the work that is going on in the food hubs, um, the like aquaponics on the roof of mm. IHS, yeah. of IHS. Like, it was just really great and really awesome to see the things that are going on here, but then also being able to see the challenged parts of the community and where we can work to strengthen what's already going on and build partnerships to make it better and connect everything. 
Okay, we're going to take a short break. One minute. We'll be right back with more. And we'll be asking you exactly what the curriculum is and who's there teaching and learning. For a very healthy summer, watch Viva Hawaii. We are uh, here live on Mondays at 3 p.m. and we bring guests like our best health coach, Elena Maganto. Uh, eat well and follow her tips. Viva la comida saludable. Hi, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. I'd love you to join us every week, Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. for E Hanakako. Let's work together. We report every week on the good things going on in our state as well as the better things that can go on in the future. We have guests covering everything from the economy, the government, and society. See you Mondays on E Hanakako at 2 o'clock p.m. Until then, I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and I'm fortunate to be able to host Sustainable Hawaii at thinktechhawaii.com. I hope you'll join in with us every Tuesday from 12 noon to 1 p.m. to see the interesting people we have to share with you their information. Aloha. We're back. We're live. We're here with uh, Justina Spiritu and Matt Johnson. They are the hosts of Hawaii Farmer, and with them... They have a special guest from the EPA, um, an or Orise fellow, Orise fellow. That's Aaron O'Keefe, who comes to participate and organize some workshops here uh, at the John A. Burns School of Medicine. They join us remote from the School of Medicine, and I'm here in our studio. And I am hoping, you know, Justine and Matt, that you will ask Aaron exactly what's going on. Maybe you know yourselves what's going on in these uh, in these uh, workshops. What's the curriculum like? What are the subjects being discussed? Who's teaching and facilitating? And who's attending? I'd like to know about that. Maybe you could ask her and see what she says. Great. Awesome. Well, why don't, <laughs> Thanks, <Jane. laughs> why don't we start with what's kind of the, the template um, structure that you guys provide? And then we can kind of give some context of what's been going on. Sure. So um, the basic structure of the program is we have obviously our main points of contact and then a steering committee going forward. Um, so the points of contact are who submits the application usually. Um, and then they put together an internal steering committee of like between six, yeah, like five or six. Yeah, around six people usually. Um, and then that group works with, um, so on the federal side, the EPA has contractors that are experts in the subject matter. So in this case, we'll food planning. Um, so we have our contractors and then our federal partners and our steering committee and we like to have um, three conference calls leading up to the workshop to just kind of a flesh out the logistics of like when, where, who and then also um, talking about the goals and making sure we really know what we're going to focus on going into it. Um, and then on the ground we have it's usually one and a half days of workshops and uh, in Honolulu we're doing two and a half days. We're going to have a design focused session tomorrow um, and that's just because of we our contractors were really um, passionate about that because of the complex TOD issues here and um, all the other things going on. So usually it's a day and a half. Um, the first day we have we like to have our steering committee and our federal partners do a community tour just to see some relevant projects in the area, um, some of the assets, some of the challenges, just so that going into the workshop, those out of town and those from in town on the steering committee are just looking at the community in a new way sometimes. Um, you get kind of built into your routine and you don't really think about what you're interacting with on the every day. So that's the real uh, benefit, I think, for the steering committee. And then for the federal partners, obviously, seeing the community since they are from out of town usually. And then after that, we have our evening session, which is often really good for getting the public engagement. It is in the evening, so we try and accommodate around people's work schedules um, for that purposefully. And we kind of talk about the goals again and make sure that those are in line with what the community wants to see. Um, it's a lot of where are we now as a community and where do we want to be. So. Um, Kind of, there's different exercises that we do in different communities. Uh, here we did an exercise called City is Play, where um, the community and everyone in the room breaks into small groups or individually 
and you use it's a really creative thing that a lot of the time when you first hear about it you're a little skeptical um <laughs> i was when i first heard about it you're using objects that you are would find in maybe like a kindergarten classroom or in a mm. toy chest like leftover objects and it really helps i think for visual thinkers and kind of sometimes in this space it's kind of hard to vocalize everything you want to say so sometimes being able to physically show that is a lot easier mm. so you take the objects and you show um what you want to see your community look like and sometimes it's easier and it, it might even make you realize things that you weren't thinking of before so i love if you could bike here or mm. having a community garden next to this or just different things that come out like that so that's one of the exercises that we did last night um so just kind of setting the tone for the next day which would be today and in the morning uh, we kind of recap what we heard yesterday making sure that we're addressing everything that the community brought up um and not leaving anything out and then from that um a lot of the time we'll do asset mapping so kind of tagging what's where in the community um to see like opportunities to connect those and then in the afternoon which is where we're at now with some people downstairs we actually flesh out the action planning on matrices so we have our three goal areas and then within those, we try and identify tangible actions in the short to long term, being like six to six months to like two years, usually, um, of the specific actions that we can do, or the community can do to get themselves off the ground and just get started and going and build some momentum. Because um, I think that's another issue that a lot of communities we've seen have is. You know what you want to do, but it's often like, very high, and mm. it's hard to think about. All right, this is what these are the steps yeah, we need to take to start there. getting there. Mm. Um, so that's what they're fleshing out right now. Um, so it's you'll have your goal, and then you'll say some actions within that goal, and within that you'll go through and say, okay, how do we want to measure the success of this action? Like, what would make that something that we're happy with yeah. and feel yeah. successful? and then who we can identify as champions that will really take ownership of that action and follow it through and see it to the end who are potential partners that they could talk to and then um a really great part about how we do have so many federal agencies funding this is that we try and get representation from all of them at these workshops so that they can share resources that their agency might have that could align with those actions and so that's another spot the matrix is um resources that it would take to do this but then also um, potential resources that you could apply for to help with that. So, uh, our partners from USDA or CDC or DOT or um, when it's applicable, the Appalachian Regional Commission or um, the Delta Regional Authority will often say, oh, well, we have this grant program that helps people that are trying to do things just like that. Mm -hmm. um, here's some information that you can apply yeah. or showing other people that they could talk to um, that would know more about things like that and opportunities. And so a good example of, of that that's kind of unfolded, um, again, we, we went on a tour uh, throughout kind of Kaka'ako to identify some of the resources that we, we have and kind of where they're at. And um, we stopped at the, the urban farm that is um, right over here by the, the medical building. Right behind the, the junk room building. Yeah. And so uh, Hunter and Urban Farm Hawaii have been working on a project where they were able to uh, use that space that's vacant right now to uh, garden and kind of grow some things. Um, they've they've had the land and they're they're kind of building it up. But for example, they the soil is not there. There's not really soil there now, and so there's um, planter planter beds. And during our tour, we have a, our other EPA contact that mentioned you know the the oh, brownfield yeah, uh, grant, uh, a resource that the EPA has that if you're looking to assess uh, a plot of land. Um, you can, they have the funding or a program that um, you can use to, to test the land and then possibly do some remediation. So that's, I think it's been great to kind of put out there, uh, like Aaron said, the things we have and maybe some of the roadblocks mm -hmm. that current projects are facing and then kind of use these federal resources, use these uh, folks that have gone to other communities uh, as one, like, hey, did you know about this? But I think we've also seen that within the community um, last night at the session when people were kind of sharing their, their kind of vision of what they want to see in terms of more local food production, 
um, how we can support farmers. Um, then we had someone step up and say, hey, I'm from this office and we offer those kind of resources if you're looking for, if you're looking for loans mm -hmm. um, or, or different networks. It's great to see again. We, I think um, we, we have a couple plans, a state, a state plan that talks about food, um, food production and food, uh, food self-sufficiency and food security, which was a, um, like a broad state level. And this isn't meant to replicate that, but to look at what we at the community level can do that's maybe currently going on that supports those priorities that we're, we're put forward when we're talking about promoting local products, um, building the capacity of farmers and, and how we can make those connections. I think kind of uh, adding on to that, it's great how you mentioned that there's all these other plans out there already and like the you know, Hawaii state plan is talking about trying to uh, decrease the amount of uh, imports into the state by a certain percentage. But what I like about this process is that we're actually getting to the nitty gritty, you know, somewhat micro projects that are actually going to, you know, lead towards actually making these goals actually feasible and actually happen. And a lot of these projects, I'm kind of like the Urban Farm Hawaii project, it's a relatively small project right now, but it's really the process that they're going through and identifying these things and if it's something that works and people are interested in then can be replicated and not just in Kaka'ako but you know communities across uh, Oahu and the rest of the state and that's what's also neat too is that we're not just looking at you know what's happening in Kaka'ako we're also looking in other areas so we went and checked out the Oahu Food Hub in Ivalea uh, which is right down the road and also checking out Pacific Gateway Center which is out in Kalihi um, so really, I think ultimately what's going to happen, and I think the goal is, you know, we're, we're focused here in Kaka'ako right now, but really looking uh, throughout entire Oahu at all the resources and interests there, and then also throughout the state as well. Let me ask you, uh, Justine and Matt, uh, one question. You, you, you were part of the group that filed the application for technical assistance. <clears throat> Has this program over the past three days met your expectations? How would you rate it? You don't mind if I ask him that, Aaron, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> um, rate it? I would say 7.859. Out, out, out of eight? <laughs> <laughs> out of 7.859. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think it has brought together um, what I've kind of learned throughout the application process where we were, you know, identifying the, me uh, in partnership with, with Daniel at HCDA, kind of identifying the folks that we knew that are working on projects and kind of the agencies and state agencies, as well as like landowners that we know we want, have to bring everyone to the table. Uh, two points with that is it is just uncovered like Excuse me. <laughs> I covered like a, a large number of additional stakeholders that are um, are active. So that's been eye opening for for me, and I think for Daniel with um, within his capacity at HCDA to to identify additional resources that they can be looking towards when they're looking at uh, the development in Kaka'ako. But it also brought people from all over the the like. Uh, what's the right word? I want to say like realm or all these different realms and industries mm. reached out to us. Um, the Department of Health and the uh, hospitals that have community benefits programs. Um, uh, some other folks that we didn't, which was, I think we've made it really hard for the EPA because we want to rope in all these people that have reached out to us. You know, with the, So we really recognize here the, the connecting force that food is. And so we have definitely... Um, not made it easy on ourselves to try to, to, to specify and, and focus on something specific because there's so much going on. And um, in addition, I think what I, what I expected out of this program and have liked about it is that um, coming from these federal agencies and the EPA uh, gives it um, not, I think it gives it some credibility in terms of, of when we say we want to have an implementation plan or, an, an, or a next step. Um, having these folks here identifying those resources, it's it's not, I mean, I feel like the conversations I have with my friends is, is kind of what went on last night. Like, what do what are you doing? What do you want to see? And I think with this program, like you mentioned, bringing together potential um, resource 
funding resources and the concluding um, implementation plan that gets deliver delivered to us from the consultants. Just we're having these discussions and they're kind of taking the notes, <laughs> doing, that, doing that transcription <laughs> of that. So they're going to hand us something that then we can use however we find it best at that at that point in the process you know if that means the way i've kind of looked at it looked at it is i think this can be a resource that we can use for uh funding grant opportunities yeah matt, the, matt of, of what justine has said how, how much of that do you agree with oh well just like normal everything <laughs> everything she said um yeah and i just to kind of reiterate that um and I think the neat thing about it is like we're kind of going through the process the, the correct way where there's all these organizations and funding opportunities will pop up and everyone runs in to put in their application and then you have you know kind of the multiple disjointed uh, project proposals going after the same pool of money so I think one of the goal or one of the potential outcomes is we identify you know community-based projects that um, you know, multiple level of groups are interested in, and then if we do come to a point like, hey, this is a project that we want to see how it happen, then the opportunities for funding become that much easier. Yeah. Because you know, if we are going to go to USDA or other funding organizations for these type of things, this is the kind of process that they like to see. Okay, it's uh, just about time to close, but Aaron, I have a question for you too to close. Right. <clears throat> so I guess you had a good time too. I'd like to know how good a time you had uh, was it as good for you as it was for those guys? And would you come back? Absolutely, I would come back. Um, I think this community has done a great job bringing people to the room. We had about 70 people at the meeting last night, which is great. And they're from all over. It's a really a great variety of people, which is nice to see. And I think that there's just a lot of great work going on here. And I would absolutely love to come back and see how it's been implemented and all the what's happened and how they can move forward. Hey, well, we'll take that as a thumbs up. Yeah, yeah. definitely a thumbs up. Thumbs up from uh, Aaron O'Keefe of the EPA, <laughs> Justine Espiritu, uh, and Matt uh, Johnson, the hosts of Hawaii Farmer. Thank you so much, you guys. Great discussion. Aloha. Thank see you, you next yeah, time. Thanks.